This is my rifle. There are many like it, but this one is mine. It is my life. I must master it as I must master my life. Without me, my rifle is useless. Without my rifle, I am useless. I must fire my rifle true. I must shoot straighter than the enemy who is trying to kill me. I must shoot him before he shoots me. I will. My rifle and I know that what counts in war is not the rounds we fire, the noise of our burst, or the smoke we make. We know that it is the hits that count. We will hit. My rifle is human, even as I am human, because it is my life. Thus, I will learn it as a brother. I will learn its weaknesses, its strengths, its parts, its accessories, its sights, and its barrel. I will keep my rifle clean and ready, even as I am clean and ready. We will become part of each other. Before God, I swear this creed. My rifle and I are the defenders of my country. We are the masters of our enemy. We are the saviors of my life. So be it until victory is America's and there is no enemy. November, 1775. Though it had yet to utter its declaration of independence, America was at war with Mother Britain. The Continental Army had been created in June and the Navy in October. And now, a committee of the Continental Congress met at Tun Tavern in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to draft a resolution calling for the creation of two battalions of Marines. And on November 10th, 1775, the Congress passed that resolution drafted by John Adams stating that particular care be taken that no persons be appointed to office or enlisted into said battalions but such as are good seamen or so acquainted with maritime affairs as to be able to serve to advantage by sea when required and that they be distinguished by the names of the first and second battalions of the American Marines. Of course Marines meaning soldiers serving on ships or under naval supervision, existed long before 1775. They are as old as naval combat, going back at least as far as ancient Greece and Rome. More recently, the British had formed modern marine units, calling them naval infantry in the 17th century for use in its wars with the Dutch. In 1739, during hostilities with Spain, King George II called for the creation of additional marine units. One regiment was drawn from American colonists. Thirty companies of a hundred men each drawn from most of the American colonies. Americans would serve as British Marines again almost 25 years later during the Seven Years' War, also called the French and Indian War. But what is a Marine? A sailor? A soldier? James Fenimore Cooper, one of the earliest historians of the U.S. Navy, wrote, The Marines are strictly infantry soldiers who are trained to serve afloat, and their discipline, equipment, character, and esprit de corps are altogether those of an army. The Marines impart to a ship of war in a great degree its high military character, they furnish all the guards and sentinels. In battle, they repel or cover the assaults of boarders, and at all times they sustain and protect the stern and necessary discipline of a ship by their organization, distinctive character, training, and, we might add, nature. It is unusual to place one of these soldiers on board a ship of war for each gun, though the rule is not absolute. It is not, however, to be understood by this that the Marines are regularly dispersed in the ship by placing them at the guns. They act together under their own officers, using their muskets and bayonets as their proper weapons. Cooper went on to say, At no period in the naval history of the world is it probable that Marines were more important than during the War of the Revolution. In many instances, they preserved the vessels of their country by suppressing the turbulence of their ill-assorted crews. And the effect of their fire, not only then, but in all the subsequent conflicts, 
has usually been singularly creditable to their steadfastness and discipline. Initially, the Marines were to be created as part of the Continental Army, but quickly it was determined that they should be independent units. On November 28th, Congress commissioned the first Marine officer, Samuel Nicholas. A local tavern owner, Nicholas was issued the first commission of captain in the new Marines, and by tradition is considered the first commandant of the Marine Corps, though the title itself did not yet exist. Captain Nicholas immediately set up recruiting officers in Tun Tavern and his own family's Conestoga Wagon Tavern. Before the end of December, he and his officers had recruited five companies of about 300 men each. Marine privates were paid six and two-thirds dollars a month for their service. But like sailors, they would receive a share of the prize money that came from any captured ship. Recruiting men turned out to be easier than arming and clothing them. The new Naval Committee in Congress did not have the money or the weapons that the Marines needed. The Pennsylvania Committee of Safety had the task of arming the Marines, but the committee also lacked sufficient arms and put out a call to the counties. The great demand for firearms in order to equip the boats and vessels employed in defense of the River Delaware and to supply the Marines on board the Continental armed vessels now ready to sail has occasioned the necessity of our collecting all the arms belonging to the public in every part of the province. The associations in this city have already delivered up all that were in their hands and we hope those in the country will cheerfully comply and deliver up all that are in their custody. By mid-January, all of the new Marines were armed, but they would have to make do without uniforms. At this early stage in the war, the colonial textile industry could barely manage to provide uniforms for the Continental Army. The Navy and Marines would have to wait for a year. But while they might wait for uniforms, they wouldn't have to wait for action. The U.S. Marines are justifiably renowned for their amphibious assaults. And within four months of the resolution creating the Marines, they conducted their first offensive amphibious operation. On January 4th, 1776, as a colonial paper reported, the first American fleet that ever swelled their sails on the Western Ocean in defense of the rights and liberties of the people of these colonies. This fleet consists of five sail and is commanded by Admiral Hopkins, a most experienced and venerable sea captain. The Admiral's ship is called the Columbus and mounts 36 guns. They sailed from Philadelphia amidst the acclamations of many thousands assembled on the joyful occasion under the display of the Union flag. With 13 stripes in the field, their destination is a secret. Those secret orders directed the fleet to harass British forces in the southern colonies. But the fleet was held up for six weeks when the river iced over, and in the meantime, Commodore Hopkins reconsidered. Reports indicated that the British might have gained superior firepower during the delay, but there was another target he knew of. New Providence Island in the British-held Bahamas, where a large store of precious gunpowder was held. Though most of the powder had been removed before the Marines could capture it, they did manage to seize 24 barrels, and the mission succeeded in striking British territories beyond the American colonies. Samuel Nicholas was promoted to major, and soon he and 300 Marines were incorporated into George Washington's army. During the American Revolution, Marines would fight alongside the army in the field and fight for the Navy on the water. In one of those sea battles, the Marines could claim as their own one of the political leaders of the Revolution and the man who drafted the resolution creating the Marines, John Adams. In February 1777, 
John Adams was on board the frigate Boston, commanded by Commodore Samuel Tucker. Tucker was there to take Adams and his 11-year-old son, John Quincy, to France, where Adams would serve as one of the American commissioners. Adams wrote in his diary that Tucker has very few seamen indeed. All is as yet chaos on board. His men are not disciplined. The Marines are not. Uh, the men are not exercised to the guns. They hardly know the ropes. Adams' opinion of Captain Tucker's men must have improved because on March 11th, he granted permission to Tucker to give chase to an enemy vessel. The ships fired upon one another and the Marines got ready to fight. Captain Tucker later reported, Being very near and in such a position that the smoke blew directly over our ship while looking around on the quarter deck observing the damage we had sustained from enemy fire, I observed Mr. Adams among my Marines, accoutred as one of them and in the act of defense. I then went to him and said, my dear sir, how come you here? With a smile, he replied, I ought to do my share of the fighting. This was sufficient for me to judge of the bravery of my venerable and patriotic friend Adams. When the war was over in 1783, both the Navy and the Marines were disbanded. Just 15 years later, however, John Adams played a role in Marine Corps history. The young country was engaged in an undeclared war with France. The Navy had been reestablished a few years earlier in 1794, and Marines were serving on ships immediately. But on July 11th, 1798, President John Adams signed into law the Act for Establishing and Organizing a Marine Corps, making them a separate branch of service. For the next century and a half, this act would serve as the only legal authority for Marine Corps missions. Two key passages dictated their primary roles. Section 3. And be it further enacted, that the detachments of the Corps of Marines hereby authorized shall be made in lieu of the respective quotas of Marines, which have been established or authorized for the frigates and other armed vessels and galleys, which shall be employed in the service of the United States. And the President of the United States may detach and appoint such of the officers of this Marine Corps to act on board the frigates and any of the armed vessels of the United States, respectively, as he shall, from time to time, judge necessary. Section 6. And be it further enacted that the Marine Corps, established by this Act, shall, at any time, be liable to do duty in the forts and garrisons of the United States, on the sea coast, or any other duty on shore, as the President, at his discretion, shall direct. So the Marine Corps would serve on land and sea alike, going wherever they were needed. But regardless of the date of this particular piece of legislation, the Marine Corps has always maintained and celebrated its birthday as November 10th, 1775, in the fires of the Revolution. Also established on July 11th, 1798, was the United States Marine Band. The band quickly gained renown within the capital and Thomas Jefferson requested that they play at his presidential inauguration. They've played at every inauguration since and have carried with them the nickname Jefferson gave them, the President's Own. The band's most famous conductor was John Philip Sousa from 1880 to 1892. Sousa shaped the Marine Band into the nation's premier military band and their concerts began drawing larger and larger audiences. Under Sousa, the Marine Band took its first tour, playing in cities across the United States. The tour was so popular that it has continued annually ever since that first in 1891. Sousa also led the Marine Band in making recordings for the phonograph, making the Marine Band among the nation's first recording stars.
Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.